Hello, and you are listening to the Salesforce Posse podcast, and I'm having a conversation with the incredible Gemma Blessed, who is CEO, founder, and chief architect of the Architects Club, and founder of the incredible Ladies Be Architects. She has inspired I don't know how many people to become architects across the globe through YouTube and her blogging, and she is a true inspiration to me. And we're going to be talking about how Salesforce architects, admins, or devs can bring bring value to their organizations and how they can align their organization's vision with Salesforce and how to manage risk and loads of other things. My name is Francis Pinder, and on the Salesforce Posse podcast, I speak with Salesforce industry influencers so we can gain a better understanding of how to excel in a career path from a Salesforce admin or developer to an architect. So if you're interested in how to connect an organization's vision to a Salesforce implementation, or you want some fantastic best practice advice throughout this vidcast, then I think you're going to get a lot of value out of what Gemma has to say in this conversation. But we did just hit record and just carried on talking. So it may seem like you've missed the first bit of the conversation, but you really haven't. So without further ado, let's go. You know, Salesforce talks a lot lot about time to value, but um in the in the more sort of enterprise settings when you're out on the ground and you're you're being sold salesforce or you're looking at 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 salesforce products and evaluating them um there's other things to consider um and other agendas like obviously you know everybody knows that salesforce can be set up very quickly and very easily (laughs) by anyone (laughs) yeah my cat can do it yeah my cat can do it they can do it on trailhead. They can come and learn, do this trail mix. You know, set, before you know it, you're set up with CRM within a week. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, all done. Right, off we go. All done. <laughs> Great. But then what about, what about getting your data in? What about once you're live? What about when you want to add something else to it? What about when it becomes complex? Like you said, Francis, when you've got something big in place that's now become rigid and become part of the business process and is hard to change. And that's yeah. when the bigger picture becomes far more important than what you build on the ground it becomes how does this flow sort of deliver these two user stories even if we want to cancel them <laughs> exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just picking an example that you you picked earlier but you know how, how does how does your your solution stack up to change and how does it stack up to yeah. the priorities of the business and and it's hard to see at the start because it is such fresh green field. Just create those flows, create those objects, and where we go. go. Uh, and it's very malleable, <laughs> you know, to make those changes. It is, and that's what makes it dangerous. But it also keeps us yeah. in a job, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> keeps us advising, keeps us warning, and and I think that um, governance. We, I mean, what the wider topic that we're discussing right now is is probably more more centered around. Um, around governance and how we actually prepare to receive Salesforce as a customer. Mm -hmm. Um, So for those who don't know anything about governance, what would you say governance, what is governance in a Salesforce project? Ways of working. Um, It's the rules of the game, the rules of the field. It's the standards that you commit to. um, And uh, and it's the methods and behaviors and culture that you plan to implement around Salesforce. That's Mm -hmm. my view anyway. And, and yeah. how that looks like, um, the, way, the way I see this most successfully is when Salesforce is treated as a living, a living system that is effectively mm. providing a, I mean, Salesforce is providing software as a service to you as the licenses, but you as a business or technology department are providing a service to your business users, your salespeople, yeah, your absolutely. salespeople by providing this system and this solution to them. So ultimately, if it's just you sitting around making decisions, when your managers who, or perhaps their managers who haven't done the job for 10 years because they've been managing for 10 years and haven't seen the trends in the industry change over the 10 years on the ground, etc., it's hard to build a system that is engaging and, and enlightening for users and helps make their yeah. job easier. Yeah, and it, they get the adoption. And I think uh, people, people miss this. Yeah, it's like the, like if you think of like just sales cloud, and I'm, if they're going from this kind of 
being able to freely talk to whatever customers they like, you know, or they know to... F- ah! <laughs> I forgot to mute my phone. That was a mistake. That's okay. Al- although I did did get a phone call from the nursery. Uh-oh. I might have a little slightly sick child, but never mind. We'll, we'll find, <laughs> find out later. <laughs> but yeah, where was I? Um, yeah, and also um, I think that if, if we talk like with Sales Cloud, um, you know, you've got salespeople that may be very manual. You know, they do good sales. They're really high performers. You know, they're talking to their customers. You know, they've got their spreadsheets and everything else, and they're used to that way of working. And that kind of, if you call it digital transformation or, or moving into using Salesforce where you potentially get recommendations from Einstein to say, hey, you should call this customer or that, it, it can be very you know, jarring and then a hard kind of world to go into. I wouldn't uh, and know then... whether to do that. If, I, if the assistant's telling me to call a customer, I would be like, guys, this is telling me to call this customer. Do you think I should? Um, yeah. or, or I would and at least it... open the account to see what other acti- activities have happened, see if I should call them or not. You know, I just yeah. wouldn't be sure. Yeah, and I and I think and I think for some people it's it's just you know is it giving them the right information? And if they call that customer and actually it's totally dead, it's no, it's pointless. Then they instantly lose adoption, and then don't use it again, kind of thing. Because um, it's trust, think, isn't it? It's trust yeah. in the system, and to to build that trust in the system, um, I think it's again like you say, like if if you if you really understand your user base and you understand yeah. what what personas exist within that user base, like the highly digital person or the highly manual, um, high-performing salesperson who doesn't really need, he's like, I just don't need this. I don't need to be logging calls and stuff. Would rather have someone do it for them. Um, yeah. <laughs> there are ways you can structure your sales organization to support that. I mean, we had yeah. we had, <laughs> we had some, some wonderfully hopeless field people who were absolutely <laughs> brilliant um, in terms of bringing sales in, wonderful performers, um, hopeless when it came to updating Salesforce, so they put them into regions and they podded them up with a tele with a tele um, a tele salesperson in the office. Hmm. So whilst they were out in the field, if they had updates, they would phone their telepod partner who would update the system, and they worked together in that pod and they shared commission between each other. Yeah, and that's they- great. Yeah, I, yeah, that's kind of really cool. Yeah, I, I had something similar where. Um, the assistants would just send a chatter message out to these really technophobe people to say, oh, we got an update on this, or I saw you went to the meeting on this, and they'd reply, and obviously chatter would associate it to the record, and then the assistant would just look at it and update the records accordingly. Um, so you still got that information in there. It was still tracked. It was still, but these people are just used to email, and that's the limit of their tech knowledge. <laughs> but brilliant yeah. salespeople, you could still you know, support them and still get them you know, getting that data in. And I think that empathy plays a huge part of that as well, because if you don't spend time putting yourself in the shoes of other people, you can't really fully understand. This is just my view. You can't really fully understand yeah. the challenges they face and the, and, and therefore spot opportunities to enable them further and help them save time and help them perform better um, mm. in ways that the system, like, you know, in, we know salespeople, salespeople have got terrible data quality, but if, you, if you've got a flow that says, you know, when they close, win this opportunity, it calls out to this system, collects company's house data, updates the rest of it, and then makes it subject to a validation rule the next time they update it. You know, that's that's done. That's data quality that's consistent. It's happening across all the records. You're getting the same data. You're getting the same behaviors. You know, it, yeah, exactly, it, yeah. It, and then it, they it, feel it, like the data, the, the, I always think of, yeah, Salesforce is an information provider rather than an information sucker in their views, in the, in the way <laughs> yeah. of using it. Yeah, and I think that uh, that's when we talk about the value, right? Because, mm. you know, so, so, again, Salesforce is a company excellent at, 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 at showing you how quickly you can get live with this stuff. But actually, the, it really does depend on you and your organization and how ready you are. How much mm. vision do you have as an organization? How prepared are you to change behaviors and cultures to realize that vision? Um, and how much should the system support you in doing that vision, in, in, in realizing that vision? So, so how, <laughs> no, no, but how, how, as you know, it's an interesting point because like, how do you connect that kind of those business goals? Because I think we do get like lost in the tech almost. <laughs> so, um, uh, and it's the tech bubble and everything, you know, learning Salesforce and every way we could possibly do anything. But how do you connect that kind of the those 
that technical outcome or, or that release to the kind of the business goals and, and the value of what Salesforce brings as an architect? Well, as a business, if you're going to start a business, you're usually going to start with objectives and key results, aren't you? Yeah. Um, your vision and strategy, you know what you want to achieve. So the architect club is a home for architects to do their best work. That's That was the vision. We want to be involved early in projects um, to help inform decisions. And we want to be paid fairly for that. That's our vision. <laughs> so <laughs> we realize that vision. We create services that, um, you know, that have a defined outcome and deliverables and objectives. But then what we try to do is 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 make sure that we then um, apply empathy to that and say, right, how would our customer, how, how, if I was a customer, how would I want to pay for this? Or what kind of, what kind of individual would I want to help me with this project? So we spent a lot of time looking at that vision and what we wanted to achieve and then building out the rest. Everything came down from that. Mm. So even down from the, from the services that we design to the marketing collateral that comes from those services down to how we then operationalize it in Salesforce so that people can put their timesheets in, get paid, and that we can mm. build a customer. So I think it's it has to start from that vision. If you don't have a vision, for you, if you're just running a business because you've got a product and you want people to pay for it, that's great. You've got a business and a product that, pe- you know, that people want to pay for. But if you then, let's say that business becomes successful, you're looking at maybe selling it or um, or merging or growing it in some other way or investing and buying other companies, you've got to get your act together for that kind of thing. And yeah. to do that, there needs to be a vision, a clear vision that investors can believe in. And the investors will want to see that vision being actually realized because that's what they're investing in later down the yeah, line. And actually- I was actually talking to an investor and he actually looks perfectly, one of his specific things when he looks at investing in companies is, do they have a mature CRM? Because he wants to know that actually the business can report on their sales forecasts, their sale progress and, and, and report about their customers. And I mm-hmm. thought, actually, yeah, that's a totally valid thing. Because if you can't, if you've got a company that can't report this stuff, <laughs> then how does he know that there's room for improvement or there's a, a growth there without seeing mm-hmm. that data? So the other thing you need quite, is yeah. a clear strategy as well, because what kind of cus- what kind of business do you want to be to your customer? Do you want to be a customer focused business where like Salesforce, for example, um, and others, yeah. other SaaS companies where it's all about the customer experience? Um, and and the story and the narrative, um, or are you a product based company? You know, and I, I worked re- uh, I worked um, fairly recently with a client who um, is looking to make that change from a product focused business to a customer focused business, mm. and um, it's it's a real challenge for them because when the language that they use when you speak to them is well, you know, the sign up process is done through the product, and then once that's done, everything else gets informed, and you know, we can't change that sign up process. And okay, yeah. well, what's be involved in changing that sort of process? Yeah. How about two weeks of work? Oh, only two weeks. <laughs> and I think, I think, and also for some companies, it's a challenge because they don't even know who their customers are. You know, if they do products, they sell them through distributors who then sell them onto shops and stuff like that. And so, actually, just figuring out who their customers are to change that model is difficult even to start off with. It all ties in as well, because then you look at uh, who are my customers, who are my lapsed customers, who are my potential prospects, and how can I actually remarket them? And Mm -hmm. is there another audience that I don't know about yet, which is an audience of interested parties who want to learn my product and might potentially Mm -hmm. take it to future employers? They're people I could nurture. They're people I could teach for the next few years, and then they'll come back. So there are so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, so do you think uh, like creating personas, segmentation is key to that? I think understanding understanding what you want to do as a business, understanding mm-hmm. who you want to be to your customers, and then understanding, you know, as you, which is absolutely key, understanding who your customers are. Um, and, yeah, the segmentation is, yeah. is important as well. Okay, so... If we've kind of understood, you know, where our, the business values are coming from, how we can help and support our customers, how does that then link to Salesforce and, and, and implementation? Yeah, well, so the, the clue is in the is in the R in CRM, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which if I think saying, people forget. <laughs> right, a relationship is a relationship between people. 
whether you know each other well or not, you've got a relationship. So, yeah. and the, the heart and soul of your business is its relationships. Yeah. Your CEO is going off to going off and, and, and networking with other CEOs. Your salespeople are out selling. Your marketing people are selling. Your billing people are talking to your customers' billing people. So there's there's interactions. There's constant interaction with customers in every department, mm. whether you know whether it's direct or, or indirect, it's happening. So the so I, I, I mean, I feel like, um, and, and back to your point earlier about investors looking for mature CRM, you can get so much insight about how your business is looking in terms of its standing and position yeah. and sales and marketing. And, the, you know, the insights that you can get are, for improvement are invaluable. My, yeah. I, lo- I mean, and Salesforce just delivers that out of the box, I think. Um, but to actually make that valuable, you've got to think about what you're doing. Um, and actually, I think you've got to prioritize the R in CRM, the relationships that you have. And actually, don't just sit on this data that's this this gold mine of information that you've got. You know, if, if your customers are reporting low satisfaction rates, that's something you, it's your responsibility to act upon as business. If that's the, if you want to be a, if that, if that's the kind of cust- the kind of uh, supplier you want to be to your customer. Mm. So, yeah, completely. Yeah, and I think it's also step. just understand it. Yeah, it's it's kind of like almost like the first step is getting a a better picture of how customer interactions happen, learning from that data, and then kind of continually improving. You mm-hmm. know, and I think that's my usual. Yeah, first step is a lot of companies just have no idea how they are interacting with their customers or their salespeople or or, or staff are, are interacting. And that, yeah, are they and, and that is. Yeah, but yeah, I think that's, yeah, day one. Listen to customer, you know, even if it's just sending out surveys and finding out, you know, your last experience, how was it? Uh, But just using Salesforce, the CTI, email tracking, you know, how they touch the website, you know, interactions and things like that. And just seeing, you know, how many touch points customers have before they actually can, you know, go to kind of call for, you know, call up and ask for a service. you know, and things like that, and how you can preempt that potentially as well, uh, and catch people uh, before they go off to a competitor. You just set a light bulb off on my head again. You do that. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you as a company, I'm thinking of um, a company I used to work for. Actually, they regularly run customer events once a year, and they invite all their customers to come along, and they they do they put on some great content about their their product and their. Um, their businesses they they give them some food and drink and a little party in the evening and it's just nice it's, it's a nice um evening out or day out for customers so if you run those kind of customer events you've actually got an opportunity here to run almost like a sideshow where you could have somebody um going through the customer interactions in a very transparent you know or a fairly transparent way you could even do a demo of, of a potential um marketing journey that I'm just picking an example um, out of thin air, but you could be talking that through with a customer and getting that live feedback direct from customers at your event. And it's costing you nothing. You've not had to send a survey out. You get FaceTime with a few customers. You get feedback, live feedback on the process. And, um, and then you can triangulate and balance that with the feedback for the end users who have to administrate this thing. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully create a fantastic customer experience as a result because you've actually listened, empathized, and, yeah, um, completely. So, and this is the design approach. This is all design. Uh, people love to give it a, a, um, give it names. At the moment, the fashionable name is design thinking. I just call it JFDI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And if yeah, you've and I think a project, it, you know, it all over the place, but we get stuff done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, just get it done. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think I'll just. Yeah, because I, I remember there was one company that um, they, they it was suddenly like kind of light bulb moment, really, where they realized they had so much data and information about their customer that they almost knew more about the customer than the customer did. Yeah. And actually, it was a great way of going, hey, look, we've created you a portal to access this tracking and information about your company that we've, we've seen using our you know, products and services. Um, and actually, you can learn from that and be a better business. And I thought that was, and for the customer, that was great. You know, there were, the, the relationship between the customers and this company 
just got tighter because of it. Uh, and um, yeah, and they loved it because they got this, you know, richer information that they could, you know, trigger well, actually what are people else, see, you know, seeing oh, in the market about us. Do I um, hear value? Oh, value. is there a value coming here? There's a value. I've got, I've got raging value. <laughs> Which is, which is it. Yeah, just connecting that value up to and, and showing it to the customer. Uh, that is think, cool. Yeah, and I always think like um, when I look at Salesforce, I look at it as a sales as value chain. Yeah, you know, mm. marketing, lead yeah. management, lead or marketing qualification, lead qualification into sales and service support, and it may be broken up front office, middle office, back office, and under that you've got people, data, and the technology supporting it, and then kind of each benefit. Um, you've got uh, each slice all the way through the pie and how you're measuring to make sure that that's kind of accurate and going through. And it's all focused on that value that you're giving back to that customer, which Absolutely. I think, yeah, and being able to kind of show that and demonstrate it is, is kind of super. And be prepared for it, I think. I think readiness is one of the biggest issues with Salesforce projects at the moment. Everyone just kind of dives in and... Mm. You know, and, and, and I might be contradicting myself in some ways because I said earlier about, you know, the JFDI approach. But I think that there's appropriate times to do that. So if you're gathering those sort of requirements on the spot, then I think that's appropriate to do it. But if you've already planned to do that, you already know that's going to be an activity. You already know that you're not you don't know the outcomes of that activity just now, but you will later. Um, and that you will go on to the next block of work after that. As long as you've got a, a, a plan, building blocks in your head of where, you, where you're going to go next, there are some areas where you can afford to be a bit more relaxed to get the best outcome and the best requirements out of people. Mm -hmm. And the, I find that the, actually it's your interpersonal skills that really play a part in that. Um, if you're in a boring requirements workshop with someone who just goes, so... Uh, so how do you how do you uh, record contact information? Do you just, do you just create a contact in Outlook? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Should we put that down as a requirement? Yeah. Okay. BA, you need to put that down as a user story. BA takes five, ten minutes to write that into a user story. And all it is is I want to sync with Outlook or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the difference is if you've got, you, you've got people coming into a room, I'm not saying you have to, you know, bring out the balloons. But a few, you know, a few fidget toys in the middle of the because people, when they're thinking, they like to touch things, especially yeah. when, especially if people have um, attention issues. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. it yeah. really does. Help. So I have my little ponies. Um, I have, yeah. This is what happens when you have a girl. Um, I don't think I've got slinkies. anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had uh, slinkies. I had um, you know the little pop toys that you can get in the works. Just plunk yeah, yeah. those in the middle of the table. Give everybody a notebook and a pen that's branded, if you want, because then they take it away. And then you and then you put a question on the board, and then you make everybody stand up, and you do a little. Everybody, English people cringe at icebreakers, but you can take them yeah. for an icebreaker without them realizing they're doing one. <laughs> right? If people, you need to. This is your chance to create a memorable experience and people remember things when they're up and moving about and mm. touching things and writing things and i think they're more open on on change and, and i think it, it's, it's kind of like getting those ideas out because it might be yeah you're, you're just documenting the as is operational way of doing things where actually you need to kind of look at it as slight different put ideas in to say well how do you mature that to the next level because we can do all this other stuff with salesforce to make it really cool but how we leverage that to support those processes and that that those requirements to make it even better it and i think you don't up when they bring the it guy in the room because the it guy is desperate to solution desperate to yes. say. i and literally ban it i, I ban it yeah. on you can't talk about salesforce salesforce does not exist, does not exist. you know it is is focused on value you know how, how you work you know the how, how you cascade that value down uh, KPI stuff like that, and it's like you don't need to talk about Salesforce at all. It really. blows their little minds, though. Yeah, I know they can't cope with it. No, they I, can't. I, like, this is an IT. This is an IT workshop. I want the system to do this. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> you want the to do great. I'm here to listen to you. So tell yeah. me, tell me, when you speak to a customer, what sort of things could you be talking about? And they go, Oh my god, I could be here all day. I'm like, Great. So they start to, well, we could be doing this. Write that up on a post-it. 
Mm. You could be doing that, write that up on a post-it. Now, if you're a BA or an admin and you're listening to this and you're feeling very daunted about the thought of standing up and acting like a basically a secondary school teacher, um, <laughs> a university lecturer, filling out post-its and you know leading workshops and putting my little ponies in the middle of the desk so they can fidget all day, this is stuff that you can do. I promise Absolutely, you. Yeah. Even if you just do a little bit of training or practice on your little brother or sister or practice on your husband or wife um, or your partner, um, run them through a couple, um, you know, give them a fictional scenario and just do a practice, just do, do an hour's practice workshop with them where you're not sat there asking them, what do you want it to do? Where you're asking them open-ended questions, mm. questions that don't have a yes or no answer, questions that might give you several like very information rich responses so, so can then, you give me an example of a kind of like a more open-ended question oh geez putting you on the spot now yes because i've got all these recordings of workshops i've done and i'm like i'm oh, gonna dig it around there no um <laughs> open-ended question okay so around sales or something um, sales um Marketing. how many okay how many um quotes no, what percentage of um, sales quotes are need to be approved by a manager and why? Hmm. You, it's definitely not a yes or no. Uh, yeah, no. I've got to answer for it. I've got to give a full exclamation about why, who approves it, and the reasons. And I might not, then you might suddenly realize that you don't know what the reasons are and you just do it. And actually, <laughs> that is a classic stuff in the process that doesn't need to be there. So as a consultant, how I would break down that response then, because I've asked that question and now I've got to take responsibility for the answer <laughs> to come back, right? I've asked yeah. the question, whatever comes back, I've got to deal with and I've got to be prepared to deal with. As an architect, this is where I, I'm very happy to have a BA with me or an admin with me who can help capture this stuff because if I'm running the workshop, I can't write as well at the same time. Mm. But there's there's good golden stuff coming out of this person's mouth. So I've then got to really listen and break down and then I've got to push out any biased thoughts that might come in because it's very tempting as they start talking to start thinking, right, we could do this in Salesforce. It could adapt yeah. in Salesforce. We could do that in Salesforce. I have to forget about Salesforce. I also have to forget any assumptions that I make about how all companies handle this situation. Not all companies do quotes the same way. Not all companies have quotes approved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but you actually, know, just pushing it out, you know, low risk. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes actually, um, I throw a little bit of humour and charm in there as well. So if if they if they're taught, if they're saying something and what they're saying sounds like okay, fair, you know, everyone else is doing that, I wouldn't do it that way, but it's I understand why. Versus, oh my god, no, why? And there have been times when I've been in, in a room with someone and you can see the despair in their face as they're explaining <laughs> how they how they send out quotes and everything, and you're just going, okay. <laughs> you know my heart I can feel it in my yeah. heart like this and at the end they're just going look, look at your face you're going <laughs> by the end of it you've bonded <laughs> yeah absolutely I, I had a similar moment with the company where uh, they were like <clears throat> yeah it takes uh, like it can take like well it usually takes about two weeks just to approve a new account and it was like we sell things on the day right and we literally are pushing sales away because we can't get the new account approved and it's like so my question is why um what what is involved in approving this account why does it have to be approved yeah so then you've got a finance answer you've got a legal entity answer you've got um a sales answer you know it's Maybe like a compliance or yeah, how, yeah how many meetings have you been in where we just talk a bit about the account record <laughs> Yeah. And all of you uh, listening oh. as well. <laughs> and the role <laughs> hierarchy. the glue for everything. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? I love this job. Yeah, yeah. It's all good fun. Okay, so um, we talked a bit around, yeah, the the uh, vision and the, the kind of setting that value to, to, you know, the things that you're doing, how you kind of elicit requirements. Or oh, actually, what I've used, started using is um, Otter quite a bit for um, just, um, recording the calls, basically, I have with people. Uh, and then it basically voice records and transcribes it all, live transcription. Um, and also, because I use it quite a bit now, it's got really accurate for the key people that I talk with. Uh, and it's great for just highlighting key things as they're speaking. 
um, um, as I'm going. But also it's got that kind of essentially a searchable reference for the entire workshop. Um, How do your customers respond to that? Because I used Fireflies for a while and customers asked me to stop using it. They thought it was Yeah, cool. I think I do. I, I'm kind of transparent at the beginning and say, hey, look, we're doing this. You know, it's just for our, our use. You know, it's not going to go anywhere else. And this is a protected room. But I think, yeah, it really depends on the type of <laughs> stakeholders and people you're talking to sometimes. Um, I, I, you do get that. Um, I don't know if you've had it in workshops where everything's going brilliantly, swimmingly well. And then suddenly you see the penny dropping and they've suddenly realized that, well, I think that actually Salesforce is going to automate them out of a job. Yeah. And you suddenly oh, have be, this. It's yeah, going to be too hard. It, yeah. It's going to be too hard. It's going to, yeah, oh, my word, this is a massive change for me. I am freaking out. Uh, and then you get that kind of shutting down thing happening. Um have you have you experienced that? Just if or is it just me? <laughs> I haven't seen people worry about being out of a job. I have seen people get protective over the work they've already completed in Salesforce. Right, um, okay. in, in the face of being told that the the org was now obsolete and legacy, and that it was hmm. through nobody's fault. It was literally the business had outgrown its org. And right, it's happening yeah. all the time, right? That's this is this is our classic kind of customer that we want to help is the ones that have outgrown their orgs, um, because that's a good time to recalibrate, rethink who you want to be, rethink what you want to do, and how you want to operationalize it. Start mm. keep the best bits, throw away the worst bits, and modify the the other bits, and start anew. Yes, it will take a little while, but you don't have to spend a whole bunch of money to do it. You can there's there's really good strategies for doing it. So mm. anyway, I've got east again because that's just me the original question was <laughs> can't remember now <laughs> no no but we, you know we've got the vision we've got the kind of the the, the value how we're bringing value to everything uh we've connected that up oh the challenge of people shutting down um oh, of course, it, yeah. yeah yeah they haven't shut down because they're worried about being out of a job they're, they're shut down because they're worried about their, how they're being perceived um whether they've their work All that effort is in vain yeah the efforts in vain but i would say it isn't you know, it's never in vain. You've spent time working on that org. You've built it up to what it is. You've responded to the requirements and the business needs as required. People have come and gone. Cultures have changed. Cultures change when people come and go. Yeah. You know, so you learned, I, you've learned a lot about how not to do it as well as you're yeah. going along. Uh, and yeah. lessons learned. So there's a lot of value in it. Yeah. Yeah. And so have the people, the people whose who's logins and users have, you've seen around the org, but they left years ago. You know, they're mm. now probably four years down the line going, God, if I was back at this organization, I'd do that differently. Yeah. Actually, I got, I got, uh, <laughs> I can't remember what event it was. Uh, a couple of months ago, somebody came up to me and said, I saw your name in some code in our org. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> it's that kind of cringe moment. Is it, is it still working? Why is it broken? <laughs> well, this is where, this is why actually having been married twice and having had three different surnames. <laughs> <laughs> and you're I mean, safe. Yeah. I mean, more orgs than you could ever know. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> well, actually, coming on to that is how do you manage risk? Like, you know, things going wrong and, you know, code that's been written by somebody else a million years ago. How, how did you deal with that? It's interesting because it depends on who you are. If you're an ISV and you've built a managed package and somebody's gone in and made a change and it's affected your managed package, there's no way on God's earth I would touch that change. Mm. And um, and I would certainly quote for, a, quote for a new project if I needed to change my code to accommodate what they were doing because ultimately what it was their decision that affected our code. Mm. And if you manage code, it's it's managed for a reason because it's to be upgraded or because it the ownership legally or the – there's legal stuff as well so um so yeah but i mean in terms of managing risk it links very closely to the overarching term of governance right and and actually i think i think our, the whole purpose of having an architect is to help manage risk mm. and that risk manifests itself in multiple ways solution risk technical debt um you know human debt like human error <laughs> Um, you've got the, the risk of business changes. I mean, we had a project recently where we found out halfway through that there was they were hiring, they were recruiting a CEO. So I yeah, raised it yeah. as immediately and said, well, what are we doing here? You know, everything's going to change when you get a new CEO. And he loves the, dynamics. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, um, they were so reassuring. They spent loads of time. They were really invested in making sure yeah. that we 
understood that risk. So they put us on a call with the chairman of the board to talk about <laughs> it and how it was going to happen and, and, and make sure that that risk could be closed off. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's a great I, example of a client taking ownership of their work as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's it. It's kind of like managing. And you're going to have unknown unknowns, you know, but if you've got a, a way of managing that as well as managing the known risks and mitigations for them, uh, even at a higher level, then you're kind of better yeah. than some, I suppose. As an admin, you might think it's just your job to do Salesforce, but it, I, I don't believe it is. I believe it's um, also your job to spot risks and to raise them at the right and to raise them appropriately. So even if you've seen something in your org that's a nagging doubt or it's a little niggle or you think, God, that's something we really, really need to sort out because this could happen. It might not happen a lot, but it could happen. The impact could be massive. Mm. If you've at least thought about the risk, thought about the impact, thought about the severity of it, thought about who's involved, you know, your project managers don't have psychic powers. You have to pay extra for that. So you need to make sure that they know what's going on in your head. If you're concerned about something, even if it's a small concern, the PM's job is to clear the way for you. The PM's, your job is to clear the way. <laughs> yes. As not well as setting up. expectations. Okay? <laughs> you're not just there to boss us about. It's a two-way job. <laughs> help, help us know what we need to do, and we'll tell you if there's yeah. anything that you need to know. And I think um, those niggles can, you know, they can... You know, if you're say if you think of a global org with twenty five thousand users in it, and you think this little you know validation rule or something um, hasn't been thought through properly uh, and is going to go to production, now you know if one salesperson has a bad day, doesn't do some sales, that's fine. But if that validation gets in and kills half the world's sales operations, then that has a, and, and it's, you know, month end or year end for the company, that could have massive ramifications for the entire company. So those little niggles, just bring them out in the open. Yeah, always, it's even if it might be, somebody has thought of it and it's fine, but yeah, constant talking and collaboration and talk, you know, making sure that everybody's kind of open with what's going on. Yeah, I had a thought then, but it went. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, oh yeah i think i think yes because because of that risk as well you've got to think about how that risk can scale you might your validation rule you've tested it on one record what if you then do a data load on ten thousand mm. records and you just get a ton of errors because you've hit all the validation rules how are you going to manage yeah. that are you going to switch the validation rule off yes of course you are <laughs> but actually it's the right thing to do to make sure all those to all those errored records are not hitting the validation rule that the data yeah. quality needs fixing so look at look at the, the the cascading impact and think about how's that going to happen for one record and how's that going to happen for all records and that will help you manage that risk as well it's you know it might sound daunting as an admin but these are all actually architect behaviors these are all behaviors that we can all adopt as admins mm -hmm. developers you know and really it just boils down to one thing don't be an asshole <laughs> Help it's, also, it's actually, you know, and I think you know, actually a validation rule is a perfect example. You, you said with data, with data quality and data management, you just put this validation rule in, but mm. that has a cascading, potential cascading effect of all the records existing in that org and could stop people from updating it. Uh, and I think uh, <laughs> and my could classic example. Coverage? Could it affect your code coverage if you've got people yeah. deploying into production? And, yeah, and even just, and also to, I think people take, Validation. I always think validation timing is really important, um, and that when you're thinking, you know, and I'm not going to say it, but I have an interview question is around this, uh, and essentially, um, when is the appropriate time for that data to be correct? Yeah, rather than because I like to keep, you know, accounts, those core objects or, or, or an opportunity really light at the beginning and make it really super easy to create because I want people to create opportunities in the system and make it easy and accounts. I don't want them to be, you know, oh, my God, I've got to put a company registration number in because it's a required field on the account or whatever it may be. Because what they do is just put junk in it and therefore you've got, a worse problem than you had before with it just being blank um but yeah yeah, yeah. We, we i'm having that problem <laughs> but, but <laughs> that way of thinking is, is exactly the same and, and and it's tempting to kind of overcook it and go oh I'll build a flow and that'll take people through a guided process and very quick to set up actually it's just as quick to just click new and fill in a few fields yeah so, exactly yeah yeah completely <laughs> 
and if you provide too many and, and UX has become more and more um, of a thing for us as well because since lightning we could we've yeah. got so much more flexibility so this is why the the design thinking the empathy needs to translate into a very um, kind of this is just my view but I prioritize user experience and user mm. experience isn't about what's on the screen and what color it is and what shape it is it's about um, what what is the journey that my users are going on to complete their task and as quickly and efficiently as possible so that we can make sure our customers are, you know, if they just do one bit and the system kicks off the invoice, kicks off, you know, books it into the accounting package and all that kind of clever stuff, how much time has that saved someone? So, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, uh, and that's just what I think about is just I've just found more success when people have spent time really understanding their users and their people and mm, they've exactly. and that builds the- you know it just builds adoption of Salesforce it builds that I kind of oh I'm actually loving using it because it's really helping me out on my job uh, rather than mm-hmm. oh it's just a tool for sales to monitor me <laughs> management or whatever it may be yeah. you know, see how I, what I'm how I am or I'm not performing so yeah. What's your yeah. views on? Um, I'm just. I've got a question for you, actually. Oh, okay. We've got a lot of solo admins in the community who who love being a solo admin. They love that they're in charge of their org. It's my baby. It's my org, etc. <laughs> for me, I see that as a huge risk. Thank you. <laughs> for me, I see that as a huge risk. Um, I, I also I love that you can have company heroes as well, but I also see those as a risk because you know people can leave <laughs> and. Um, and people can take knowledge away with them or, you know, so it is always a bit of a risk. So as a solo admin, um, obviously a lot of their, because they're making decisions about the, the org, ultimately they are also acting as architects as well yeah. because they're in charge of that destiny. What do you think is the difference, if any? So, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of always say that, you know, a, the difference between a design decision you're making as an admin or a developer versus an architect is a design decision that's hard or costly to change in the future. So, uh, and that could be just creating an object in Salesforce. Because once you created that object, you're creating a load of flows on top, you're creating loads of reporting on top, you could have integrations to it, and suddenly this object becomes really hard to change in the future. So really, everybody's an architect almost in some respects um because if you think in 10 years time that is going to be a problem um but on the kind of flip side of that i think the admin role is a very actually i was talking to somebody about this before uh somebody else actually recently and like if you could if you if i could wind back the clock yeah 15 years i think i would have told salesforce do not have a or have a role of admin, but don't have it in what where, what it's become now. Yeah, because um, I you think the, uh, you mean the narrative. Yeah, of of what an admin is, because you've got this kind of sense from the outside world as an admin that just oh you just create users and reports, right? You're the bottom uh, of the, the bottom, bottom of the, food of the pile, pack. which is totally not wrong. No, you and can't. I think of yeah, and I think of it as a graph, right? So you have the um, vertical, vertical and horizontal access axes, which is size of company and complexity of org. Yeah, and you can have diff- the you know put orgs or, or implementations all over this graph. Yeah, so you could have a really large company with a really simple org, or you could have a really small company with a really complex org. Mm-hmm. And now, if you draw a line all the way through the middle of that graph, an admin could literally be anywhere on that line. Yeah. Absolutely. You could be this, you know, you're working for a small company on a small, small project and great, you know, you can do the admin bits, you can kind of stumble along a bit, um, or it you really can be a massive company. really affects your experience, though. Hmm? You're working, it really affects your, sorry to interrupt, I'm terrible yeah. for doing um, <laughs> um, it. Really, it really affects your career experience, the projects that you choose and the, mm. the directions that you choose to go in as well so I think it's really important like I I love what you said about that graph if you're an admin going for an interview it's well worth looking at the company you're interviewing for and making your own assessment based on where that role is on the graph yeah where is it on the graph what kind of experience what am I going to learn hold them accountable ask them open questions what am I going to learn from this role yeah. What are you and I, always, I always think of that when I, I it's always splitting it around you they are not interviewing you you are interviewing them really to Absolutely. see if it's the right you, fit for you 
And it's got to align to your strengths, your goals, where you want to get to, uh, and making sure that um, you're getting a positive, you know, it's giving you, because it might be something, you know, you could be really good at something uh, and people see that you're really good at it and they keep on giving you more of that stuff, but it doesn't really give you joy. It doesn't really give you passion in doing it. And it's really kind of figuring out what that is. And once you figure that out, it might be the culture of the of the project uh, or the company. It might be the type of work you're doing. Then you know, yeah, using this line, where you want to be and where you are right now, so you can see that this that the, the company you're going to work for is a in between those two or is further ahead. So you know that that is a good career progression for yourself. And obviously, the best yeah. best way to get promoted is to quit. <laughs> so can, I share, to can, can I share? Can I share that actually? Yeah. Because that, that sounds a bit like my own career trajectory. Um, as, as, I mean, Francis and I have worked in the UK and doing Salesforce um, probably in parallel. For yeah. like the last 15 years. <laughs> yeah. I think I came to one of, when you worked at, tw- at 2020, I came for an interview there and I saw you there. No way, and, really? Yeah, I saw you there and I was like, that's that Francis guy who does the, the, the training. And, um, <laughs> you know, like, he's like famous. Uh, oh, my <laughs> me. The blast of the blast. <laughs> yeah, you get to know faces. You get to yeah, know who companies are. Companies come and go. They're all snapped up and, and acquired, merged, you know, whatever. Everybody, you know, it's it's a very buoyant market. And that makes it fun if you're if – you're, if you're, I've always been client-facing. Um, I start – well, apart from when I started. I started as an admin. I wasn't a solo admin. I was in a team of three. Um, I was the baby. And my job was to update Salesforce and to support all the salespeople on the floor with it and make sure they could use Connect for Outlook, Francis. Do you remember the old one? Yeah, I, I remember. I installing that on computers and removing keys and all that sort of nonsense. Oh, it was my just, word, yeah. yeah. But I got really friendly with the salespeople and it suited my personality. I'm an extrovert. I love people to an extent um, until, until I'm, I'm fed up and I put my headphones on and, like, go away. Um <laughs> But I liked it there for a while, and but I got bored of being in one place and dealing with one org and the same set of data all the time. And I could feel myself getting possessive over the data quality. And I was like, this isn't healthy. Like, I want to go and do this for other companies. So mm-hmm. I spoke to Julie, who was the other lady in the team. Um, and Julie um, had a lot of experience as a business analyst um, and had worked for the company for a long time and was Mrs. Salesforce. She knew everything about Salesforce. She was involved in, a, in an advanced quoting project, which is basically homegrown CPQ. Um, she was working with Cognizant regularly on doing that. So they were building it for us. And mm. my job was to support the project. And I loved I loved that she, she would ask me things like, what do the users think about this? Or mm. if it's a phone support, she would say, right, if you're phoning support or you're, con- you're, you're logging a case with support, this is the sort of stuff you need to do to make it useful so that they can help you. Yeah. And so she taught me better ways of asking questions and better ways of teaching um, users and listening to people. And I took that into my next role and I hopped for a few roles into consultancy. And in that time, I went from sort of 25K um, yeah. to about 50K in five years, um, mm. which, you know, is actually quite a small amount now in the UK um, for that sort of role. But at the time, I was, what, 25, yeah. 26? I was very happy. Money with was that. more then. <laughs> it was beer money. It was beer yeah. and rent. I didn't have any kids, husbands. You know, it was yeah, exactly. Like, so we were down the Antelope every Friday night. You know, so <laughs> um, so it was beer money. Um, but then it became more interesting than that. It was like, okay, this is actually a calling for me. I really enjoy working with Salesforce, and I get a real satisfaction out of handing it over to a new person and mm. seeing how delighted they are with it and. And I decided that um, I wanted to go and work for Blue Wolf one day. Um, I saw what they were doing. I liked um, their approach. I um, saw how they'd grown. There were a few famous famous names working there that, um, that and some previous colleagues that I'd worked with. But I knew they were a premium sort of blue band consultancy mm. who'd been there since the beginning, and that was where I wanted to be. So I thought, what do I want? What, what sort of work do I need to do in order to get there? Yeah. And I did a bit of contract work, did some corporate projects, worked with larger customers. And then um, eventually, um, after I had my baby, I decided to go into full-time work because contracting is really stressful when you've got a baby. 
<laughs> yeah, same. Yeah, I did the same. To be honest, bad, bad <laughs> or payers. semi wasn't semi. It was part time, but yeah. Yeah, bad payers and all of that, and yeah. you know, I just had Molly and I was feeding her myself and things like that. But that was cute because I had great clients who let me bring the baby to meetings. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I was literally stood there, bit, like they were all burping the baby while I'm whiteboarding. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Lovely. So, out there. so, <clears throat> so what? So, when you think of the Salesforce community, what kind of springs to mind? Compared with first other words, yeah. first word, love. Yeah. <laughs> and that's because of where I am in my in my life's journey at the moment. Yeah. I'm also and nostalgic so don't worry but um i would say actually um the actual deep word community if you think about what community actually means it, what it is to people it's a sense of belonging and i think and it's united by a common interest you've got yeah. communities for everything absolutely anything and everything as we know so and and what binds those people together is the shared interest so mm. i i really value the salesforce community because of well chats like this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> chats with friends open honest chats um mm. you know sharing experiences and stories i'm, I'm very much a storyteller and i absorb yeah. stories i just love hearing about other people's lives and stories and things they inspire me so um so there's learning, there's, mm -hmm. and then there's just this unsaid support. Like you're automatically accepted into the Salesforce community. Yeah. Until, until you misbehave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you move on to a competitor. No. Uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but generally, still, yeah. Still. Generally, everybody's really nice. But we've only yeah. had a few bad eggs and that's <laughs> not, <laughs> it's not even had that big of an impact, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it's such a massive cares, community right? anyway. It's kind of like you're inevitably going to get the odd one or two, but you know, it's con yeah, consistently. I think it's yeah, it's a fantastic community. And I think actually, if you're the kind of person like yourself, I think um, you get a lot out of serving. Mm. Just serving the serving a community of people or giving something, you know. Like the, the, recently, the the death of the Queen has made me think a lot about that because of the like the lifelong service that she gave. Yeah. You know, even through just standing around at Trooping the Collar for four hours, and I'm sat there going, "This lady's got eighty. Why didn't someone get her a chair?" But when you think about, when you think about um, service, you know, some people. For some people, service in whatever form is a calling for them. Doctors, mm. nurses, carers. Um, for us, our service is that we want to help people succeed in the Salesforce community. So you do your training. Mm. I do my blogs and things when I can be bothered. But, you know, but, but we spend time together having these conversations in the hope that if someone's listening, they find it useful and they, they use it in some way. It helps them succeed. You know, we can yeah. smile at them. And we have no and idea the impact. It. We can elevate as uh, all of us, <laughs> you know, in That's learning from each other. Yeah, we sat here having this conversation. You know, we could find out in ten years' time, someone comes up to you at Dreamforce Francis and says, "Do you remember that po that's that's that podcast?" Well, it made mm. me do this. Now I'm that. Mm. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And I, I, it that's is really it is amazing how many people come up to me in just random situations, kind of going, "Hey, ten years ago." I did your course. I had no money. It was the actually. It was literally a couple of weeks ago. Somebody was saying how, um, if you remember, like Greece economy crashed. This guy had no money or anything. He kind of got the course that managed to get him out of Greece to the UK. He got certified, and he's now kind of working at a Salesforce consultancy. And it's like just those kind of stories are just incredible, and, and they're great when you're having like a bit of a bad day, and you can go, "Oh yes," <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look back I at those that. kind of those stories I and. And, and I said to Ben yeah. McCarthy as well, but uh, Salesforce Ben, um, we often have no idea the impact we have when we, when we put out like this. We're just sat at home doing this recording, you know, with my fake <laughs> wallpaper. <laughs> I'm sorry, it would look like I, I, live, I work in a WeWork. <laughs> I just need a plant. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. It's got to be fake and plastic, though, you know. <laughs> no, but, you know, I, I've given myself a calendar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, someone else bought me that. But, you know, <laughs> we just sat here doing this and, and putting blogs out and stuff. And when I think, I think also you, people don't 
underestimate the mountain of value and knowledge they have. And they think, well, doesn't everybody know this? And actually, no, they don't. <laughs> and, and you all have, you know, information. And even if you think, you know, you might be working in a, you know, a different industry using Salesforce in a different way, in a different country to everybody else. And even just those three different things makes the usage of Salesforce radically different. And actually, <laughs> that's useful things for other people to learn from. Um, mm -hmm. So, Jeff, it can be disheartening. So, yeah. It can be disheartening yeah. if management aren't with you on it. Um, it can be disheartening if you go in with lots and lots of creative ideas and they just get shot down. Yeah. <laughs> if Probably you get me, yeah. that's making you unhappy, vote with your feet. Go and find a job Absolutely, that makes you happy. Yeah. yeah, and find that, yeah, find that company that you're passionate with or charity or organization, whatever it may be, uh, that kind of aligns to those back to those your know, your goals and, and your strengths and what you get a kick out of. Because uh, your just... time is your time is the most valuable thing that you have. And Absolutely, if you spend, yeah. You spend six months of it working at a place that makes you unhappy. That's six months of black cloud unhappiness in your life. Yeah, exactly. You don't, you don't have to. You don't have to suffer that. No, completely. Okay, so Gemma, <laughs> <laughs> life uh, advice. It, yeah, exactly. Okay, so here we go. This is a question <laughs> I ask everybody. Okay, so if you could rewind the clock back to a point in time, yeah, and you could give yourself certain words of wisdom uh, what point of time would that be and what advice would you give yourself gosh that's really interesting i would give myself the advice to work backwards think about your outcome what do you want to get out of this experience and that could be any experience it could be going to the shop Right. For me, I manage my anxiety um, uh, and I, ha I have anxieties about going to Tesco. I can't think of anything worse than going into, into a supermarket. I can't stand the place. And it, it does get me. I have to put headphones on, put music on and, or podcasts mm. or something, just walk around because that's the only way I stay calm. Um, to handle that, I almost kind of think about, OK, my outcome is I want to walk out with a bag of shopping and I don't want to be like shaken and, you know, frightened. So how do I achieve that? Well, I'll park in, I'll park fairly near to the to the front i've got my pound coin ready for my test for my trolley i'll use scan and shop because then i don't have to worry don't have to rely on someone else that takes mm -hmm. some stress away. i'll i'll go up the left side of the supermarket first then i'll come down the right side etc and then i've got a system so and the outcome is is i have a calm shopping trip and a, and a trolley full of shopping at the end you, know? <laughs> you don't go hungry <laughs> exactly. don't go hungry same like if, if you're dating somebody i mean dating right now is a minefield for anybody so i feel <laughs> single at the moment i you know I, i'm just no i'm just not in there um but thinking of the outcome you know do i want to just have a nice dinner with this person and see you know or or am i do i desperately want them to phone me tomorrow <laughs> etc mm. so i i found that i would go back to my 20 year old self and say that mm. So what, my about, 20s? Because was that a finishing of school? and Because at age 20, that was roughly when I started to uh, stabilise. My moods were stabilising. I had some issues hmm. with depression and anxiety from the age of 17 to about 20, and they were quite severe. Um, so I really struggled with all of that. So I would go back to age 20 because that was roughly when things started to stabilise. I moved yeah. home. I was at uni. I was commuting to uni from rugby to Northampton every day. And, you know, I was relatively calm. I had a calm existence. Yeah. So, and <laughs> and at the time, I had a long distance relationship. So I would go and I didn't know what, where it was going, didn't care oh, where right. it was going day to day. So, and that was how I made mistakes. Right. Okay. So Interesting. think of what you want to achieve. I say it to customers all the time and then I don't go and do it in my own life. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, have you got anything else to say, Gemma? <laughs> After that, you know. <laughs> oh, drop. No, I, I'm no expert. All I know is, you know, I'm 38. I am at the end of my life. Um, it's been a wonderful time to reflect and think about what's important. And I, I suppose my biggest, my biggest um, takeaways from all of this and all of this Salesforce experience and even just, just knowing all of you um, is even even if I popped into your life for a little while and shook things up, <laughs> maybe one day when you're in the nursing home pretending to be deaf, you'll think back <laughs> about this crazy girl <laughs> who changed your, knocked you onto a slightly different path. Yeah, uh, who, who you gave were... you this 
report telling you that your Salesforce org was shit, needed redoing. <laughs> And you went, yeah, okay, Gemma, and then went off and did your own thing anyway. <laughs> but it's not just all that, you know, all your videos, everything, you, all your blogs, everything you put up, you know, you've been a massive, you know, influence <clears throat> on me I've, and everybody in the community. I've so, done it through know. love. I've done yeah. it, because, I've literally done it through love because I have an awful lot of love to give and, you know, I wanted to give it to all of you. So, Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Gemma, for being on the podcast. It's been... Thank you fantastic <laughs> thanks for watching or listening to the salesforce posse podcast now please 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 if you like or what you see or hear then please rate this podcast in your podcast player as it tells me that there are people out there that actually are listening to this and that it's useful to them also it helps the podcast algorithms to kind of elevate the podcast in the different podcast directories which will be really helpful for me as well and finally if you do have a question that you want to ask on the podcast then head to salesforceposse.com slash message and maybe you'll appear in the next podcast but apart from that thanks for listening and until next time ta-ta